This week's theme on the Retirement Quick Tips podcast is, are the days of ultra low interest rates gone for good? And what does that mean for you and your personal finances, your investments, et cetera? Okay, so today I'm talking about part two of the case for higher interest rates. Why why does it make sense? Why is it reasonable to assume that interest rates are gonna stay higher for longer? Yesterday I talked about sticky inflation that's preventing the Fed from lowering interest rates. And today I'm going to talk about some other factors. So we have a economy that's been very resilient in the face of higher interest rates. Nothing's broken quite yet. Maybe it will at some point, but not yet. And the other factor is deglobalization. So When the economy is still doing well, there's no urgency for the Fed to start lowering interest rates because there's no obvious signs that the the higher interest rate environment is causing stress. There are definitely signs of cracks in the system and certain pockets of the economy that are doing terrible right now. But the overall economy is not on the brink of some collapse or major downturn. And so since the unemployment rate still is quite low, People are still paying their mortgages, their rent, their bills. There hasn't been a broad real estate crisis. Another theory, too, for why the economy has been so resilient in the face of higher interest rates and higher inflation is also demographics. You have this massive wave of baby boomers, right? Most of you listening to this podcast are in the baby boomer generation, and you are reaching or you have already reached your peak wealth. You are the richest you've been as a group. You are also the wealthiest generation in the history of the world. (laughs) That is a really cool badge of honor, in my opinion. But you have these large swaths of Americans that, of course, are not doing well financially. But that's concentrated mostly in younger generations. You know, you hear about Gen Z and some younger millennials, especially, they can't buy a house. They have so much in student loan debt, et cetera. So I'm not denying that there, even of the baby boomer generation, lots of people are struggling financially. But as a group, the numbers don't lie. So you have many boomers and many Gen Xers now. The Gen Xers are entering into their 50s and they're entering their peak earning years The Gen Xers combined with the baby boomers, right now it's about 40% of the U.S. population. So again, a large percentage of the U.S. population is not as impacted by higher interest rates and higher inflation. You've already bought your house. You're probably sitting in your house and still paying your 3% mortgage if you haven't already paid it off. You don't have tons of crushing student loan debt. You have money in the bank. You have money in your 401k. According to Fortune magazine, the average net worth of a baby boomer is between $970,000 and $1.2 million. Now, average net worth is not the best measurement because you have very, very, very wealthy boomers who are skewing that average. The median, in other words, half of the people are above that, half of the people are below that, is lower than that. But In general, as a group, you've enjoyed substantial growth in your investments in recent years. Your home value probably has doubled. If you haven't moved, you know, in the last 10 years, you've seen your home value double, if not go up more than that. Again, you're probably still locked into that three to 4% mortgage. If you're working, your kids are now out of the house. You're not spending so much on them. So you're able to travel. You're able to eat out more. Maybe buying a new car isn't much of a financial stress. Maybe you can remodel your house, do some upgrades. You might complain about higher prices on everything, but it's not significantly altering your spending because your income keeps going up. Maybe not a huge amount, maybe so, but inflation hasn't eroded your spending ability, your net worth. Again, I know this is not everyone's experience, but in general terms, that's what has happened as the generation of, as a whole with boomers and also Gen Xers as well. Even some older millennials haven't really felt the inflation crunch as much. So it's not as much of a concern. And again, you make up so much of the population overall right now that boomers are even benefiting from higher interest rates because you can finally earn some interest on your cash, your bond investments. That's coming at the perfect time too, as you want to become more conservative with your investments, get closer to retirement, enter retirement, et cetera. So the bottom line here is that the demographic reason for higher interest rates for longer is that the Fed can't lower interest rates because the rate of spending, we're still as a consumer society 
fueling that inflation because we haven't stopped spending. So spending in the face of higher prices, higher inflation, it hasn't come down enough. And you see that reflected in the data as well. So more spending continues to fuel this higher inflation, doesn't appear to be changing unless something else in the economy breaks. So one other reason for inflation that may stick around for a few years, and this is a bit more complicated and nuanced, is that ever since COVID, as a nation, we're in a, as a world, actually, we're in this period of deglobalization. You also might hear it referred to as reshoring or reindustrialization, basically bringing manufacturing back to the U.S. or at least closer to home, not importing as much, not buying goods as much from China and other places. There's a lot of reasons for this. You have some national security risks with what China and Russia and everybody else is doing. Everybody's sort of turning in on themselves a little bit as a protection mechanism. You also have weaknesses in the global supply chains. Now, this was obviously a big problem in COVID, but you also have it uh, places with like the Suez Canal. And, you know, the U.S. has been the police of the, of the seas and allowed for free flowing trade. But a lot has changed in recent years and it's not as free flowing anymore. The other thing is you're seeing tariffs. So like the Biden administration recently slapped a bunch of tariffs on Chinese goods. You have a 100% tariff on Chinese electric vehicles. And that is just one example. But when you look at the big picture, you have trade that's not free flowing like it was just a few years ago before COVID. We're importing less goods from outside the United States. We're beefing up our manufacturing. It is much more expensive to produce a product made in the United States than a product made in many other countries outside. So what that does is that keeps prices of goods and services higher. It keeps that upward pressure on inflation. Now, long term, though, this deglobalization, it could end up being a net positive for the U.S. because it can increase productivity. It can help our competitiveness around the world. In the meantime, though, it's going to keep prices and inflation higher if that trend of reshoring and deglobalization continues, which it looks like it is definitely going to. All right. I went a little bit long today, but these issues are nuanced and I think they're important for understanding why interest rates may remain higher for longer. But that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Ashley Michike, and this is the Retirement Quick Tips Podcast.